have a clearer picture of what this uh, DSLs uh, means that, that we've talked a bit before. And um, yeah, I think we'll just uh, jump right into it. So um, when it comes to simulations, um, one interesting thing is that there's th these simulations, they, they kind of can be looked at from different levels. Um, and basically kind of goes, you go, you start in, in a very, from the very abstract description, and then you can go down to very concrete implementations. And I mean, at the highest level, these um, simulations are really, um, they're governed by, by physical and mathematical equations, kind of the very basic physical equations that are sometimes also very um, specific to metrology. There's a lot of research in there. Um, I think it's super interesting. But, but these mathematical equations, they don't give you results like that. They, they don't have closed form solutions. Um, we need to kind of run simulations um, to get results um, from this, especially when we go to larger scales. Um, so uh, what we do next is we discretize like these, um, the, these fields that appear in, in physics. And then we can use um, um, numerical approximations. Um, so algorithms to approximate the, the solutions to these um, equations. But uh, even if we approximate that, we also need to implement that. And then it should be implemented in a way that it runs well on your machine and it, it runs fast because, it, well, scientific performance is very important, but um, uh, speed performance is, is also very important. That's kind of like the very lowest level, that concrete implementation. So um, we're going to look at a, a simple example here. Um, let's see if I can get the pointer going. Okay, so I, th I hopefully you can see my pointer now. So um, yeah, in a weather simulations, we have we have uh, uh, the, the, these fields here, such as such as the pressure, and what we often with these fields, what to do want to do is um, compute a gradient, um, because when we take the gradient from a pressure field, this is uh, proportional to the wind acceleration, and um, yeah, these equations they can become very complicated, and there's some um, some really smart people working on those. And um, there's a lot of gradients in there. So let's have a look at how we can, um, yeah, let's have a look at this gradient example. What it means going from the highest level, the mathematical level, down to the, the actual implementation so that it runs fast um, on, on our machines. Um, so the, the highest level is the mathematics. We take here the example of a one-dimensional sinus curve. Um, and, the, and the gradient is in the, here, it's the derivative. So this is uh, shown here by this, by this displayed by this tangent here. Um, there's a lot of topic on, on um, topic on those, but um, this is more for the for the um, actual like uh, metrologists and climatologists um, that, that are going to work on this mathematical level. So when we go further, we can discretize this uh, sinus, this continuous mathematical sinus curve. We can discretize this by having um, different points and at different locations we will um, uh, store the value. And I mean, we have discretized this this mathematical continuous um, curve into into a, a computer representation that is discrete, and the tangent then here kind of becomes this connection between these two dots. And then we go further down at the algorithmic level where we want to compute this gradient. Um, and what we do is we just kind of take the difference between these these two points, and that's kind of the um, the, the same equation on a, in, a, in a very, let's say, practical practical form that's suitable for, for computers. And you can see it's here this difference between these two fields divided by the um, width. And this is very similar to what we know from uh, calculus. So, but this doesn't run on computers <laughs> still either. This is still a mathematical um, object. But then we go into um, the actual implementation. So the, here we have an example of this uh, where this formula here is um, implemented in Fortran code. This is um, taken from the ICON model. So this is uh, the uh, globe of the ICON model. And um, we can see here that we have like this difference here between those two values. And then we divide by this um, length here. And that's uh, basically the, what the code would look like that would kind of like um, that, that resulted from starting at this very high level of um, computing a gradient. Um, so that's the original code. It runs sequentially. You can see there is the mathematics in there. Um, and, and then there's also the mesh in there. So for example, the, uh, the first loop, we loop over the uh, uh, vertical um, space. And then the second loop, we, we iterate over the whole globe, for example, on a, on a more of a horizontal um, sp uh, uh, space. Um, so 
that's fine. <laughs> but the issue is that it only runs on one single machine. So all these millions of cores that we would want to use, we just cannot use. So next year, we have to make sure that it runs on multiple cores. And um, the way, uh, sorry, on, on multiple machines, actual separate machines. So one way we can do this is to, we, we can uh, take the whole sphere and we can separate it into, into separate blocks. And then each block is going to be computed by one single machine and then they will update each other with information. And then they will, this way we can make um, the simulation run on multiple multiple machines. So we, we add a new loop here and we have blocking here and kind of the thing gets a bit more complicated, but it runs on multiple machines now. So what we do next is actually, it runs on multiple machines, but if one machine has multiple cores, uh, we, we can't really take advantage of that. So so what we do next is we, um, hang on, um, I think we go here, yeah. So next we add um, OpenMP uh, directives to it. So it runs on, uh, we can uh, um, make use of uh, multi-threading and we can make use of the shared memory on, on a single machine. So we add these uh, these directives here, then we put some if devs here, if, if this if a user wishes to activate OpenMP or not. And then, yeah, we, we need to add these directives. But so so that's nice, it runs on multiple machines. It can make use of multiple threads on a, on a single machine. Um, but that's only CPUs. So actually we also want to have um, GPUs. So here we're gonna actually use um, open ACC directives. And well, we, we have, you know, this, this other case, this if dev case. And yeah, we, so now we have kind of, um, well, we, we, have, we have GPUs, but then also for GPUs, memory layout matters a lot. So we probably want to have a different layout there. Um, and for that, yeah, that makes the code kind of more complicated again. And as we as we optimize this code more and more for different architectures, what's really a big shame is that we kind of started off with this simple difference division thing. We, it's still in there, but a lot of things have, have come on top of it. <laughs> and there's a lot of kind of noise. So for example, for a domain scientist, let's say a metrologist, this is this is really cumbersome because they um, they they just want to look at, at this level here, but now they get all these other things on top of it, um, and and at the same time for um, for the optimization engineers, this is also not so nice because they are mostly concerned, they're mostly interested in these parts, but um, yeah, these these equations are obviously really important for these parts as well. So some some of the big issues with he with this is. Um, if if um, if we want to change things around, so for example, what if we want to not use? Um, so basically, there's different ways we can approximate this gradient. So one one way we looked at so far was to use this difference and this this division um, operation, but there's like higher orders order um, approximations that give more accurate results, and in some cases we want to use those. So basically, then we need to kind of rewrite this part here. But well, this part is all dependent on, on these things and, and it's really easy to make mistakes, right? Because this part here, it kind of, it runs on GPUs, CPU, uh, multiple machines, multiple threads. I mean, I can test this on my GPU machine, but I, I can't really be sure then that it's gonna run well on the CPU machine, that, that there could be a bug. And it's it's also very kind of straining <laughs> just, just for the human mind to keep track of all these indices and, and all, all these interdependencies. Um, and then maybe there's going to be a new hardware that, um, yeah, that 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 requires that has different um, requirements with respect to optimization, or for example the the mesh we want to make change how how the mesh works. So the mesh was kind of the the first um, approximation, the discretization um, that that we first did, um, and if we change that, then that's going to affect a lot of the code here. Um, and, an and another um, interesting case is actually sometimes you want to express your loops differently. So for example, as we added all these directives, what was kind of nice is that our changes were, let's say additive, as in like we could just add them, but this is not always the case. There are sometimes cases where I want to write, kind of rewrite the loop completely. And it's not really possible to have both versions with one single um, uh, source code. And and I mean, we, we've actually had cases like this and, and there's actually a kind of big frameworks built around where what you do is you you have these loops and then you add directives and they will kind of rewrite the loops. 
um, because because some of these changes are not um, are not really compatible. It's not really possible to to express them with the same source. Um, and then one one um, kind of a simple example could be that maybe I'm using a compiler that is super high performance, super state of the art, but unfortunately it has a bug because it's not that well tested. And to work around that bug, I, I should just rewrite something a little bit differently. But um, well, this little bit differently rewriting kind of now all of a sudden involves all these uh, other other um, complex things. So that's um, yeah, that's really really a really big issue. Um, it's a, it's a very real issue, and um, one one way to um, tackle this is um, with the separation of concerns principle from uh, the software engineering um, discipline. So yeah what can we do with this issue what 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 is what are ways to kind of um uh, lower the impact of of this issue um and one one um what, what we really would like to do is separate kind of the the high level equation from the implementation details and the implementation details that are specific to optimizations and specific to um uh, hardware arch architectures and one one very promising approach so far has been domain specific languages and um, that's kind of something that we've been exploring a lot at uh, Meteor Swiss. So um, let's talk about domain specific languages. What are they actually? So those are programming languages that are tailored to specific problems. So the domain here, it really means kind of application domain. It can mean like your scientific domain, um, such as weather modeling or um, deep learning or, or image processing um, or other, other parts. Um, so, um, other examples are um, HTML for web pages, markup languages, PostScripts for um, um, documents, and, and MATLAB, for example, can be also considered a domain-specific language, which is specific to the kind of mathematical domain. Um, so we're really mostly interested in TSLs for high-performance computing, and um, particularly weather weather models. Um, so we've been yeah, exploring them a lot um, in, in, in the last few years. And they're kind of becoming very like a viable solution to this to this um, to this problem, and it allows us to kind of have one single truth source of, source of truth, which is kind of a, more of a higher level description, and then um, and then let, let the that compiler of the DSL take care of um, optimization and, and hardware um, specifics, and they've also given us really really promising uh, performance results, um, which is obviously very important. That's really nice. And also another benefit is that these domain specific language are, are very specific to the domain. So they're really for, for weather domains. And that allows us, we can design the language to have, for example, constructs that allow us to express um, our equations very um, in, in very precise and very, very short manner, instead of having a lot of loops and indices and a lot of kind of, let's say implied noise um, in a way. Um, so, um, some some applications for um, high performance computing DSLs would be in image processing. There's Halide, deep learning as um, there's a huge industry there. There's um, XLA, and then in, in climate and numerical weather predictions, we have things such as Stella, Grid Tools, Dawn, and uh, Cyclone. So to illustrate this um, kind of benefit of DSLs, um, how this works is kind of we have yeah this this kind of high level discretization of the of the mathematical equation. Then we can write this in, in our DSL. I'm going to say a, a bit um, about, about this in a minute. And then this is kind of the input of the DSL compiler. And then the output is the actual implementation. So that's um, where all the performance details come in. And, and we can tell the DSL compiler that we want to compile an open MP version for this. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to add all these, um, all these details that are very important for performance for this hardware. Um, and, and maybe a short example, uh, short word, a few words here. So this is five lines of code, which is much less than what we've seen at the, at the very top. So you might not recognize here exactly this uh, equation in here because this is kind of expressed on a, let's say a higher level. And the reason why this is, is that um, m previously most models, they used um, cubes and squares to approximate their fields. But um, ICON, which is the model that we're a lot interested in, it uses triangles. And that kind of changes a lot of the things. And actually, this form here allows you to um, express these equations for both cases. So we support both triangles and, um, and squares. And, and that's also a, another benefit um, because, because it's a high level and it's very specialized for, for, um, for this use case. Um, and then 
next, what we can also do is we can say, well, we want to have an open ACC version of this um, of this code here, and the compiler can uh, it can generate this. And then, of course, we can also say, well, we want the C++ version, and then the compiler can automatically generate this. And this is kind of really nice because the separation of concerns is kind of is reestablished again in that we have on the left-hand side kind of the high-level equation that um, domain scientists can, can work on, the people that know the, the physics and, the, and, the, and all these things happening in the atmosphere and the oceans, they can, um, the scientists can, can work on this kind of higher level. Whereas let's say the, the optimis optimization engineers or the, uh, the HPC special specialists, they would be more interested, well, they would really work on these DSL compilers where it can, where it can implement transformations that, that will make the code run fast on different hardwares. And they will, they will take care of a lot of the details to, to um, really allow it to, to, to run fast. Um, and I, I mean, I think the, the example is really nice, right? Because this is kind of the equation. And then there's a lot of details here. And I mean, this code is very, very difficult to work with. Um, and that's kind of the, um, the, the, the kind of the, the main idea of this, this TSL approach to have this nice clean separation. And hopefully this way we can have, um, well, uh, kind of um, find a bit of a solution to this, um, to, to this 3P problem. Um, yeah, so that's um, mostly about DSLs. Um, and I think next um, Rupert's gonna go a little bit further and he's gonna talk a little bit um, about um, some very similar approaches there. Um, Rupert, can you take over from here or do you need to stop sharing? I'm not sure. Let's let's see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I'm moving a pointer now. We can both do it together if you like. <laughs> yeah, we can oh, right. yeah. We can stay as we are. Thank, thanks, Ben. That's brilliant. Okay. I shall share my lovely face as well again. Okay, so uh, that's brilliant. Thank, thanks for that. Um, there's a few more slides left, not not many. Um, so um, you, you've, you've been sh Ben shown how, how powerful DSLs can be um, in that um, you know you can write a, a short amount of high high level code and you can produce lots of different um, code from that and you, essentially you can separate out the science um, that you're writing um, from lots of different implementations so you have a tree you can you can have one one implementation of the science and that allows you to to then uh, generate different solutions, different optimized solutions on different architectures. So that kind of solves this problem we were talking about before. We separated out the science from, uh, from its implement implementation on different architectures. Um, and DSLs are really powerful for this. Um, but but, um, but, uh, but um, in order to use them, you've, you, have to, you have to rewrite your code. It's a revolutionary approach. So if you have existing code, um, you then have to say, okay, well, I'm going to rewrite it in in the in this DSL approach, and then use the DSL from now on. Um, my, my view is that's a win 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 situation, and and um, you know we're we're kind of evangelists of DSLs, but there is this there is this cost that you have to rewrite. Um, and uh, one of the issues, uh, another issue is that um, you know applications exist, um, and and they're they're very very large. As we said before, millions of lines of code. And, and they're under continuous development. Um, so, so to ask people to, to, to drop what they're doing and then to go to something completely different and start from there is, is quite a big, a big ask for a big institution. Um, and uh, whilst, whilst we're making very good progress and showing, showing some good results, DSLs are relatively new and relatively untested in this domain. Um, I say relatively untested, they are used in some cases. Meteo Swiss do use a DSL now um, so, so, you know, it's not completely untested, but they're relatively untested. Um, and one of the things that comes up when we give presentations quite a lot is, is concerns over, over whether these tools that we're developing, because you need, you need these code generators and you need, uh, you need to support the new languages and things, whether, whether these tools are going to be exist in the long term, is, is this just something you're doing for now and then, uh, and then, and then you're going to disappear in a few years time, retire or, you know, whatever, get run over by a bus, what happens? So, um, so there is this concern, quite rightly, about um, about these things. Um, uh, I think I said this third point already, but basically, yeah, th there's a big thing. It's, it's, it's a, to add to add in to make changes to an existing sci science code base. Um, if you make some some disruptive changes to the science, the scientists have to stop for a bit, 
um, and then and then they have to uh, then they have to uh, basically start from 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 scratch, and and so that that is time and effort. Um, and I think the last thing is that there's uh, rightly or wrongly, and I, I don't think it's wrong, is that there's a lot of skill and knowledge built up over a very long period of time, 30 years or whatever. Some people aren't that old, of course, working that long, but some of us are. Um, and they have knowledge and skills um, in terms of how to get performance out of Fortran. There was a question there before asking, how do I make Fortran fast? Um, well, you know, that there are lots of books you can read and lots of things, but a lot of it's experience. And if you know um, how, how to make things so fast, you know, and then and then you get told to go into another domain, then then you know then, then you, you've lost you've lost some of that that knowledge potentially. Um, so is there an alternative or or is there kind of a halfway house? Well, what if you could actually take existing code? Um, and you could essentially translate that into a DSL approach, and 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 and, um, and then and use your existing code as the front end, and then and then rewrite that code. So rather than code generation, it's more like code translation. So if you could do that, that would essentially allow you to to work from uh, an existing code base, code you've already got, um, and it's allow you to translate that into uh, into different solutions ra rather than having to go and, and rewrite things. Um, so the advantages of this approach is that um, actually one of the things that um, issues with DSLs is, is, is in their name, domain specific. We only support certain constructs. Um, so you might have something that, uh, that understands about finite elements or something that understands about stencils. Um, so so um, if if you have something that is outside of that domain, how, how do you support that in a DSL? You can't, it has to be outside that. But if you can write it in code, um, then you can actually potentially use it in the, in, in the DSL itself. Um, and this approach essentially supports an evolutionary approach, not a revolutionary approach. Um, and, and, um, and, and in order to do this, you need to support both code generation and translation. Um, so, so um, but to do this, essentially, you, you need to regain lost information because you end up with code and you need to kind of come back up the tree a bit. And, and, and I'll, I'll show a picture of that in, in, in a second. Um, so these things aren't, um, they, they aren't incompatible with each other. Um, you, you can support an evolutionary approach and work your way towards a revolutionary approach because you could, you could support existing code and, and bring it into a DSL. And then people could then start rewriting parts of the code um, in, a, in a higher level DSL approach and gradually work their way across. So it's, it's a, it potentially a mix and match approach if you do this. Um, so, so just to go back to this, uh, these levels of abstraction we talked about before, if you remember there were these four, there was the maths that, uh, that Ben talked about, discretization, algorithm and implementation. Now they're all kind of from, from the, uh, the point of view of a, a domain specific language. Kind of beneath this is what we produce. So we produce what I've called language specific down here. Essentially, language specific is that code that we, um, the uh, Fortran code we saw before. It's a, it's where you have your your Fortran or your C. You might add in MPI. You might add in OpenMP. You might add in OpenACC. Whatever. Um, but that is the that's that is the the code. And and um, and, and we're going to have presentations on uh, talking about specific DSLs um, after the break. Um, and one of them is Dawn, and Dawn is is, is the one you saw uh, Ben kind of described, and and it, it really sits in it's only in the DSL world, and it sits in the kind of um, algorithm and implementation. So you can you can have control over the algorithm to some extent, and obviously over the implementation and different ways in which you you produce language specific things. Cyclone takes a slightly different approach. Um, in that uh, it, it allows you to go for multiple implementations, but it also supports existing code as well. Um, now, these are separate systems, but uh, in the Easy Ways 2 project, we are looking at how these two systems might interoperate with each other. Um, we're not gonna go into that in, in detail, but it's early days anyway, but there are some promising uh, results showing that um, you might be able to take some code in Cyclone, for example, and put it into its representation it understands. And, and uh, Andy will talk about the representations a little bit later. Um, 
and actually translate that into something that Dawn understands. So you might be able to use some cyclone and then actually use Dawn and potentially the other way around as well. So, um, so we are looking into that, but that's very early days. Um, but they are essentially separate systems. Uh, the reason I say this is because we're going to talk about the two examples. Um, but, but, um, but also, people do ask this question, why are there multiple DSLs? Well, I mean, by definition, DSL is domain specific. So if you have a different domain, you're going to have a different DSL. But we do look to see whether there's interoper interoperability between these things. OK. Um, and just to show uh, pictorially, we do this. So, th so this is also a, um, a gradient, gradient code, and th this comes uh, straight out of Nemo. I think this is a Nemo code that produces a computes a gradient, and um, this is Fortran code. Has nothing extra in it other than uh, um, so nested loops, and then you do you compute your gradient. So re relatively simple, not as high level as uh, as the DSLU that representation you saw before, but um, not not that difficult. It doesn't have any of the extra uh, complexities of open AP, MP, uh, open ACC, all those things. Um, and then what, what you can do is you can parse that using a Fortran front end into a DSL. And then the DSL will take that and, uh, and turn that into a language independent um, layer. And it knows, it knows about, about, um, about these loops that it's got K, J and I and what they mean. And if you look on, uh, you look on this loop, this loop says this is of type latitude. It's worked out it's type latitude. This is type longitude and this is type levels. So we've got some information from this code and we've now gone into a slightly higher level. We, we can reason about that. Um, and then from that, this language independent one, we can then add in OpenMP or OpenACC directives and spit that out into Fortran. But because we've gone into language independent, we can also go into other languages potentially. And we're working on so that some of those things that Simon talked about before, um, OpenCL and COCOS, and other things like that. So, so this, is, this is an approach where you can take potentially some existing code, very constrained, but you can still do that, um, and, then, uh, and then maybe, maybe do that. So, so this, is a, this is a slightly different approach. OK, so going on to a, a, a summary. So um, in order to, to do modeling, it requires expertise in in, in many di disciplines, and, and, that, and that requires co-design between different ex experts and expertise. And these disciplines tend to work at different levels of abstraction, from the from the high level mathematics down to the algorithms, down into the implementation. Um, and if we mix our science and performance, it can produce very complex code, as you've seen. Uh, so if we can separate these concerns, separation of concerns, that is a very good thing to be able to do. And DSLs do offer a way of doing this. Um, and DSLs typically work at a high level of abstraction than the low level code. And the higher level you go, um, the greater choice you have. Um, and, and the more choice you have, essentially, the more performance you can get. I mean, the more choice, because, because if you make a certain decision, that constrains you. So, so as you go down this tree, you make decisions, and that constrains you. Um, and of course, different DSLs can work at different levels of abstraction. We could have the magic DSL where you just wrote some maths on a whiteboard and it automatically ran everything for you. Of course, that's, that's going to be quite difficult to do. But uh, the higher level you can go, um, the, the, essentially, the better it is for the scientist. Um, so the higher level we can go in DSLs, the better. Um, but in weather and climate models, there are these very large existing codes and make people translate into a DSL, all of these things is quite a difficult task. So um, it, it's, in some cases, it might be useful to be able to support an evolutionary approach as well as a revolutionary approach. OK, I think that's it, apart from just to tell you that next we're going to have a, a break. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, Dawn and Cyclone in more detail and then have the tutorial. OK, I think we've finished on that. Um, so I see that there have been lots of questions as we go along, and they've been answered, some of those. Andy, did, have you seen anything that's outstanding that, um, that we might, uh, might try and answer? Hi, Rupert. I just copied here a question. OK, thank you. Thanks, Luciana. Um, from Riju, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly how to speak his name. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, right, so so um, 
I mean, the, the, the thing is with DSLs, I mean, so, so let's, let's take Dawn. The, the Dawn DSL is essentially um, works for stencil-based codes. So it's a stencil-based solution. Um, and, and Ben and Carlos can, can chime in if, if, if they want to. Um, so, so as long as your, your code um, fits, fits in with that model, the model of, of being a stencil-based code, then you can use the DSL with it. It's not, uh, I mean, th the point about DSLs is they are domain specific and you need to decide what domain you're working on. Cyclone is similar. Um, it, it assumes that, um, that you have uh, a domain and you're, you're working across it, you have ind independent competence. So essentially it's a finite element or finite difference based. If you have finite element or finite different based codes, then that's the type of code that, uh, that will be used with this DSL. Other domains, you need other DSLs. This domain you use these. Um, yeah, j just for the record, because uh, I forgot to read the question. <laughs> so the question was about uh, if I have a simple linear regression uh, machine learning model code to estimate our quality, then in this case, what's the role of DSL? That's yeah, sorry. The I, sorry. I, yeah, thanks, thanks. I should have, I should have said uh, I, should, I should have said that. Yeah. So so I mean. Um, Presumably, the ML code um, will not will be a different structure to this. It, it may potentially call multiple small versions um, of, of models within it. I guess um, so. So if it does that, um, then then you would use the DSL for that. It, it may you may be able to partition it up into bits and then and then you can call it. It depends on the structure of, of the code basically. If it fits into the to the constraints of, of what the DSL supports, then you can then you can use it. And if it if it doesn't, then you have to use something else. So there's another question because usually you already have a code for a model, but a new model could be completely written in DSL from scratch, as you say. Yes, that's right. Oh. Is it our aim to make DSLs widely accepted so that in the future this could be the standard approach? Yes, I, I uh, thanks. Thanks, Giacomo. Yeah, yes. Oh, um, so so I think that's really, the question for Marco. That's the question that Giacomo was answering for Marco. Ah, OK. OK. Um, well, I'll, I'll write, I see. OK, so um, so I, I'll, I'll ask, I'll look at the next one. It is really good also said the, the word translating. So why should I rewrite my code? Why not doing it from scratch? Okay, I mean, so when when um, when you start from an existing code, there are there are there are constraints, and I think Andy will maybe talk about that. Um, so you you can't go quite as far as you could with a full DSL. It's also um, it's not it's a, a DSL can write things at a higher level if you've seen. So it's it's much more concise. Uh, neater way to write a DSL uh, to, to do things when you use a DSL directly as a front end. So I think the aim is is over time for for people to gradually move to a higher level representation. I think that's that would be a good thing for everybody. Um, but we do need to support existing code as well, I believe. So it's really about where you are. If you have an existing code. Um, then you might be able to get some benefits from DSLs um, by using this evolutionary approach. Um, but if if uh, if you're starting a new model, um, or or if if um, certain parts of that model you decide you want to to um, to to rewrite, then you then I think it's a good idea to uh, to use a DSL. In my opinion, that's what I, I would say about those. Okay, th thanks everybody. Uh, we're, we're, we're about five minutes over, so I, I suggest we, uh, we, we stop now. Um, and we all go and have our cups of tea or coffee or whatever we like. Um, so uh, we do have a little bit of leeway. So, so I think um, we'll give ourselves, um, so it's, we'll give ourselves until 10.50 um, UK time, which I guess is 11.50 in Europe. Um, so, uh, so, there's, so we've still got 15 minutes. Um, so we'll, I'll see you all in in just under under 15 minutes. But thanks everybody. We'll we'll, we'll see you in a bit.